Seeing AI meets Generative AI, The View from Microsoft. Speakers, Saqib Sheikh, co-founder of Seeing AI, Microsoft. Moderator, Devin Coldaway, writer and photographer, TechCrunch. Thanks, Alice. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here at SciTech Global. Um, Saqib, thanks for joining me here today. Uh, since we last talked, AI has become much more prominent in the tech world. Uh, though not necessarily all in ways that uh, contribute to accessibility. Maybe you can tell me first uh, what you're working on and what you've worked on, and then maybe you can tell me what you think are the, the more interesting aspects of uh, the new AI ecosystem that we're all taking part in right now. Oh, thank you so much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And yeah, as you say, it's an incredibly exciting time, especially when you think about AI accessibility. So... At Microsoft, I lead the Seeing AI team, where we look at emerging technologies and how we leverage these to empower people with disabilities, especially people who are blind or have low vision, in their everyday lives. And we've been doing this for a number of years. We made an app which seems to be pretty popular, but as we look at the latest generation of AI, a lot of those early visions and ideas that we had all those years ago it really feels like we've taken this big step forward as an industry towards realizing that. So I remember when I started this a few years back, I would think of, could AI be like a sighted guide, someone who knows you as, knows you as a human, who understands the visual world and can fill in that gap by describing what's around you at the right time. And maybe you could have a conversation with them. And yeah, like you said, AI, it's come a long way this past year and we're busy building towards that future. It feels like you, you sort of touched on this, but it feels like there's a very stark difference, though, between a technology like ChatGPT, which we're all now familiar with, uh, and how it can be useful to a blind or uh, low vision person, uh, and technology like Seeing AI, which is really designed from the ground up uh, for specific needs. As someone who both builds and uses these tools, can you tell me why that difference is important? So I think whenever you think about de developing these kind of technologies, it's, you know, nothing about us without us. So when you build with the community, as we do with Seeing AI, then you can have these really rich natural experiences tailor-made for this community. So ChatGPT, incredibly useful for someone who's blind. Same with all the other Microsoft Copilot products which are coming out. With Seeing AI, we're all focused in on what can you do through the power of your smartphone camera and the AI based on that? So it's very much about, okay, the cam what can the camera see? What can it tell you? And increasingly, what could you ask of it? So it's chat of a different sort. So maybe you can tell us a little about what uh, the latest sort of frontiers are on that side, on the side that you're working on. Like, what are these, uh, what are the latest developments in what you can ask about an image, what you can uh, extract from an image and the kind of uh, the, the utility that you can get out of that? Yeah, so with this next generation of what we call generative AI, it means we can leverage these large models which can give us so much richer information. But up till now, we've been able to give you descriptions of an image, which could be a sentence. And it might, for example, tell you that it's um, a man and a boy in a park. But now we can have way richer descriptions that might be you know, a paragraph or multiple paragraphs in some cases, which can go into the detail about okay, here's a man and this is what he's wearing and this is more about what he's doing and this is the boy and there's uh, trees of this sort in the background and oh, there's this visible as well and there's mountains further in the background. And it's a level of detail that I as a blind person never knew existed, let alone had access to. And I do remember the first time I encountered this kind of description I was just, you know, blown away. It's like a whole new frontier. And then that's the beginning. Like when you're a creator, um, innovation keeps going and it's like, okay, this is what we have now, but I can't imagine where it's going to go next. So 
yeah, that's that's probably the biggest step forward. But then you mentioned also this idea of can we now talk to our uh, smartphone, whether it's a photo or in the future a video, and get even more information. So maybe it can have all this information about the world, but now it can be a two-way conversation. So you can pick out the things that are important to you in this moment in time. Sometimes it's easier to show than tell. So here's a picture that I took with my son when we were in the aquarium. And you can see a description, how rich it is, and also how you can ask questions about it. What do the starfish look like? The starfish in the image have various appearances. Some are bright orange with long, slender arms, while others are larger with a more robust structure and a mottled pattern of orange, brown, and white. There is also a starfish with a pinkish-red color and a bumpy texture on its surface. They are all submerged in water. How many starfish are there? There are at least 15 starfish visible in the image. Tell me more about the pink starfish. The pink starfish in the image has a textured surface covered in numerous small, rounded protrusions. It is located towards the bottom left of the image, partially overlapping with an orange starfish. The pink starfish has five arms, typical of starfish, and is surrounded by various other starfish and sea creatures in different colors and sizes. And uh, speaking of what's important to you at this moment in time, I know that uh, seeing AI has sort of built up into a collection of specialized models. And this one is, you know, specifically for navigating a room, or this one is specifically for uh, identifying a label, uh, these kind of everyday tasks. Is that still, is that model of like having these different specialized uh, models going to stay important, you think? I think, yeah, I think it's going to be a hybrid approach. You have these large models, which are by their nature, slower, but incredibly powerful. But then we have developed over time interesting user experiences to work in real time to help you line up a good photo or to tell you things that you need to know in milliseconds, not seconds. And that's going to remain increasingly important. But then it's going to be a hybrid approach where those things are paired with the rich descriptions, the Q&A conversation, et cetera, that the large models will give us. And again, that's going to change because I say all this and it's really just a moment in time. Um, everything is probably going to become faster, more powerful and so forth, as is the way with our industry. And that's what makes it so exciting. You know, I'm curious, you you were describing this and I was uh, the, the new being being able to describe things with much more detail. I'm I'm wondering how that might work in uh, in media, TV, and movies, paintings. There's so much more detail there that isn't always hit on in the like audio descriptions or the scene descriptions. It seems like it'd be it'd be so cool to be able to pause the the video or whatever and say like, oh well, what's going on right now? Where is the character standing? What does the landscape look like? Like I'm just my mind is just like fizzing with the possibilities for this technology. Yeah, absolutely, I, like I am at Microsoft. There's you know this term co-pilot and this idea that you know you'll have an AI to assist you with every app that you use or every product and I sometimes say that seeing AI for someone who's blind seeing AI is your co-pilot for life so if you're watching a movie I imagine and we have you know we're busy prototyping in the lab but I imagine that could we describe the video that you're watching when you're browsing the web what does it mean for a blind person to have help with a web page or completing whatever task they're doing in whatever app they're doing on the computer. So spanning media, digital life, maybe even games one day, and of course the physical world. So yeah, I think there's so much possibilities here and combining all the different bits of AI that we have, whether that be speech or vision or understanding text, I just think all of this is gonna come together. And of course, this is not next month, probably not even next year, but things are moving so fast at the moment and we're really re-examining what's possible. There's all these things which we've decided, oh, that's years away, we're not doing that, which we have to now re-examine and think, what if we could? It is a, it is a, a sort of a hopeful moment, but there's also new risks, right? Like this is one of the one of the most uh, prominent risks that we've encountered with generative AI is obviously it's uh, it kind of approximates knowledge rather than repeating it or it may 
you know, hallucinate details in a scene. Uh, you know, it didn't in, uh, in any of the things that I've seen uh, describing the scenes, but there's always that risk. Is it, are there new risks and tensions being introduced by the inclusion of generative AI or large language models in the sort of accessibility world here? Yes, absolutely. And I think it's always been true that AI, by definition, is sort of this probabilistic view of the world. And that's even more true of generative AI. I think one of the challenges is that when it's wrong, it's very, very confidently and convincingly wrong. And that's why we you know we're being a bit cautious. We're developing with the community. So we have a bunch of testers who are working with us to make sure that these solutions work in all different scenarios for different types of people. But we we do find hallucinations to be a problem. And you know, we're figuring out the workarounds and so forth so that we can have even if it's a bit less capable we have more reliable solutions um and yeah answering questions about if you're asking open-ended questions that definitely matters because you're relying on the ai and you want it to be robust and reliable or to tell you accurately when it doesn't know yeah and, and maybe you can uh, we can go a little further onto that the side of uh, working with the community. Well, one of the first things you told me in this interview just uh, just now was nothing with, about us without us. Uh, that's obviously a, a foundational aspect of uh, developing with the accessibility community and for all different uh, abilities and disabilities. And uh, it's how do you how do you do that when well, what, maybe you can tell us about your model for working with the community first, and then we can talk about how that might change when you're working with other models or other companies. Yeah, so I often think that, you know, we are this bridge. We talk to the people who are blind or have low vision and the people who we wish to serve on the one side. And then we're talking to scientists, researchers, um, external companies, academia, on the other hand, and then thinking, okay, we have these emerging technologies, these new techniques, new models, but it's not about the technology, it's about the needs of the individual. What are the challenges and how do we bring that technology to bear? So that's you know the early ideation or development stage, but then as you get to that more polished stage, then it's working with people so that we can identify the issues, understand, is this really solving the user need we set out to solve? And, you know, where are the potential risks and pitfalls and make sure we catch them early on so we can find new solutions and new workarounds. And is that something uh, that you think are other companies doing that adequately? Like, you know, OpenAI seems like a bunch of very smart people, but it's not exactly, ChatGPT wasn't built specifically with, you know, the blind and low vision community in mind, even though it's, of course, very useful to everybody. Uh, do you think that that's something that needs to be worked on, not just by OpenAI, but by anybody who is pursuing AI as a general purpose uh, a technology? I think, you know, human-centered solutions are key. And as an industry, we've come a long way in understanding that. I would you know, draw this distinction in a way between a platform and an experience. Much of what a platform company does is produce building blocks, which other people are gonna build experiences out of. And at some point, a platform could in theory be for absolutely everyone. And then the experience, it could be for everyone, but it could be like seeing AI very targeted. So I think there's that aspect where when you're building the experience, that's the point that you really need to uh, make sure it is going to serve your audience well. But then, you know, if there are products at uh, Microsoft and elsewhere where everyone is your audience, and that's where the good practices of inclusive design come in, making sure that you're testing with a diverse audience that represents the breadth of people and you don't exclude anyone by accident. Uh, you mentioned when we were talking before uh, how obviously these large language models are extremely smart, but uh, they are also primarily text-based, and they're still they're working on the multimodal side of things. But 
you mentioned that you know GPT-4 can do a lot of things, but it can't really help you navigate a subway station or get around, uh, you know, find a shop in a mall or identify, you know, the ingredients of a, of a, a can of soup or something like that. Um, do these, are these always going to need a, a, a seeing eye, a seeing AI type solution? Or do you think that the general models will sort of reach out and subsume these use cases as well? So now we do have the multimodal GPT amongst other models and other solutions, but yeah, I, I gotta say, you know, GPT's multimodal capabilities are very impressive. Um, I still think we need faster models and more specialized models as well, but maybe over time, I do imagine that there'll be other similar multimodal models, which maybe some will run on device and so on and so forth. So, so things are going to change, but at the end of the day, the way you stitch together the models, the way you fine tune the models or prompt the models, that's what's going to make the difference because like you say, there might come a day when the AI can help you navigate and find the shop, find the platform and the subway station. We're really not there now, partly because of the technical limitations of these models and partly because there's one thing to like tell you what's there. It's quite another to have the end-to-end -end interactive real-time experience that's not going to distract you from, you know, navigating with all your other capabilities. So I'm cautious to say, you know, it's not possible today, but who knows what's possible even in a few months or a year or two. Yeah, it's developing so fast. It's it's yeah. almost scary. It's, you know, it's not that scary because the capabilities are so interesting and so helpful. It's uh, so thinking like, oh well, we can't do that today. It's just like wait a couple of months and there'll be a new paper. There'll be a new uh, a new model. Um, obviously, you, you mentioned this before. Uh, Microsoft is hugely in this space. Uh, and they're partnering with OpenAI. They're doing their own stuff. Um, the the co-pilots and stuff that those are all coming out in they're going to be in windows they're going to be in office they're going to be in all these productivity things um i think it's, it's interesting because all users will benefit from this you know if you want to use this it could be useful uh but people who have trouble interacting with the visual U a gui in the first place you know where there's insufficient uh accessibility tools to use them it feels like they'll have like a, like a supercharged situation i'm hoping that that's the case anyway um, how do you how do you see that playing out? And is there any particular sort of capability you're looking forward to in the the sort of co-pilot space? Yeah, and this is again, we're still relatively early on in 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 this stage of co-pilots. But as someone who's blind, I'm very excited by the possibility of having a co-pilot that might tell me, okay, this document I've, I've written, is it formatted well? And you know, if it has knowledge of the visual appearance, then could it do that? And these are just all ideas, you know, I'm not, not saying that it's something that's possible today, but, or if you have huge spreadsheets with loads of data, can we get your co-pilot to help you analyze all the data or spot the trends or so forth, or even to generate content, so generating images or reports. These are things that, you know, everyone is going to be using, but I think for people with disabilities, there will be unique types of tasks which will be um, really helped by having, your, you know, your personal co-pilot to help you accomplish these tasks. And this is kind of cool because when you have one user interface, there's this assumption that the designer, the developer of the interface, knew exactly how everyone wants to use their product. Mm -hmm. But like, like, but in this AI world, you can actually have different types of people, all with different needs, different styles of using the system, and the AI can answer their questions and provide the information in whatever way is right for them. And yeah, today, the fashion way of doing that is via this chat interface. Who knows what it'll be tomorrow? Yeah, truly, truly nobody does. Um, <laughs> but, but of course, it has to be guided, as you mentioned before, it has to be guided by the users and by the community and by feedback. Um, do you, do you, uh, as, a, as an early user of it, do you have any feedback on it? And do you expect that it will be guided by 
um, or sort of supercharged uh, itself by the, the feedback from uh, blind and low vision users? Yeah, I, I absolutely hope so. So I'm I'm enjoying it. I'm still at the stage where I'm exploring what's possible. And I, I, do, I provide my feedback, but, you know, as a group, as a community, I'm sure, you know, we will have many tips and tricks and ideas for each other of how to use the systems, but then also for the creators um, like Microsoft about that will influence the next generation. So tell me, uh, we, we've talked a lot about uh, what we're hopeful about. Maybe you can uh, get a little bit into uh, what you feel most skeptical about, the claims or the tools that you think may or may not uh, uh that may not live up to the the promises. Uh, is there anything in particular that you are that you're worried about or more skeptical about? I'm a little bit skeptical of everything I got to say because <laughs> there's almost so much hyperbole at the moment, and it's like, wow, AI is going to change everything. And I meet scientists who maybe a year ago were you know hard at work on this model that technique and now they're like oh computer vision it's a solved problem i'm like it's not like if i as a blind person want if i i could list you the first 10 things i do in my day and i can think of dozens of ways to make each and every one of those more productive and better and are we going to say these large, large models are going to solve everything are we saying oh we're approaching agi artificial general intelligence, and then it's just going to solve everything. No, I still feel we're a really long way off. So on the one hand, I'm so optimistic, but on the other hand, and this is just my lived experience, there are, of course, you know, so many users in the world with their own experiences. But if I just pick the example of, you know, I get out of the Uber and now I'm going to try and find the door to the building and now I'm going to find my way to um, the cafe and join the end of the queue and know what to order and um, go and take my tray and find an empty table with my friend and say hi. Yeah, is AI there today? It can probably do each of the building blocks. But until we get to this sort of AGI future, which I think is much hyped and we're probably still a ways away, there's still a lot to be done. So I am very optimistic but skeptical of the, of some of the hype. Yeah. Um, I think absolutely. that's another thing, which is, which is also we want to make, equity is important. We're going to make sure that not everyone has access to super fast internet and the latest AI and the latest everything. We want to make sure, and this has been a focus for us over this past year as well, that just the basics, the basics of being able to read well, or recognize products and all those things are done even better than before. And then now we can get this out to more people. So there's so many people all around the world and we'd love to bring generative AI to everyone. But even if we can bring some subset of this, I think we could help so many people in their daily lives. So just a few days ago, we launched Seeing AI on Android and I'm very excited to think how that can get out onto much, much cheaper phones. And in the upcoming weeks, and we're going to be launching in a whole bunch of new languages to about 36, I believe. So that's the other side of what I'm doing, that thinking about, OK, let's really push the edge of what's possible. But then let's scale that benefit out to help as many people as possible. So. It's not so much that I'm skeptical of all the amazing new stuff, but it is that I want to make sure it's available to everyone. Yeah, absolutely. That equity piece is, is super important. The languages, like I think uh, you mentioned something like 36 languages, like that that expands the scope to so many people who I'm sure would love to use the app or, you know, use it in certain situations and can't because they're just like, well, I mean, because I speak Portuguese, that's just how it is. And uh, and now, like, it's available. I don't know if it's available in Portuguese, but uh, hopefully it will be soon. Um, but it's like, that is that is such an expansion. It doesn't have to, like you don't, like you said, you don't have to push at the very frontiers to enable more and more people. I saw a, uh, a, a wonderful um, a model that was being done by some Swiss students. Literally all it does was when you walk into a room, it helps you find an empty chair. There's no other task. And it's just like, 
that's it's such a simple thing but like of course anybody should be able to do that and like they and they were just like well this is a common problem let's solve that we don't need to worry about the the you know the, the cutting edge stuff let's just get see if we can make everyday tasks easier um so we only have about a minute left i'm uh, i'm curious there's there's sort of one last thing i wanted to ask you about self driving cars <laughs> see let's this is a like just one of these areas that i think is just like a cutting edge technology super interesting super like focused on accessibility in a way but has just there's been a lot of movement on it recently and i'm curious where you think we're going with this i'm just going to say yes please <laughs> I, <laughs> um i really want this to happen and in the same way that you know the work we do on seeing ai i definitely want that ai sighted companion as i'm walking around yeah then i want to get in a self driving car and be taken across town too and then you get out and uh, and do all the things that you mentioned. All the pieces will fit together. I think I think it's a it's a wonderful vision, and uh, I think that you are accomplishing it with seeing AI with the with the help of all these other technologies. Um, anything else? We've only just got a few seconds left, but uh, is there anything else you want to talk about that's uh, coming out in the next uh, week or two? Um, no, it's really just we're building this one step at a time. We've yeah and i think it's the perfect time ai is getting better we've been thinking about wearables for years now and wearables are entering the mainstream now personalization really helps have human-centric ai you put all this together and this idea of the ai that just describes the world for you with we're, we're really closer than ever before it's an exciting time and yeah we'd love to hear from anyone seeing ai at microsoft.com well Thank you very much. With that, uh, I think we can wrap it up. Thank you as always. Thank you so much.